So how do we deteriorate from that optimal point to a place where sustained chronic abuse occurs? Well, uh, number one, you taboo in secrecy, uh, you know, you, you wall off the terrain with secrecy because it's not intelligent that one person spending 20 minutes can affect another person's life for years. It's not intelligent. And so this, this has to be addressed as part of a, an intelligent culture. But if you don't want to address it, you have to make it secret. Now, there's many, many ways of making something secret. It's looking away, turning attention elsewhere. Even though we know this is going on, we're not going to we're not going to touch it in school. We're not going to touch it at church. We're not going to touch it at work. We're not going to touch it in dating. And we're just not going to talk about it. So this is the first part of the defense and the first part of the craziness. We're not going to deal with the pink elephant in the room. So uh, secrecy and taboo is how a cult maintains an unhealthy abuse system. Um, with that secrecy comes the next level of the defense, which is ignorance. Because if no one is talking about things, and you can think of the, the current protocols of uh, the way parents protect children. They'll say, don't spend time with strangers. They won't deal with the issue head on. They won't talk about sexual violation because that breaks the taboo. Then the child might say, well, why aren't we learning this in school? And because it, it's an obvious question. So instead of addressing the issues head on or the patterns of behavior head on, people do an incredibly healthy, unhealthy you know, diversion, which is to say those types of people, but they are not defined because most of those definitions don't hold up. People with earrings, what, you know, who are men? Don't, that's a, don't hang out with strange men, don't. And who are strange men? Anyone that we don't know. So don't connect with people. Stay insular and isolated. And one of the reasons this doesn't work and, you know, is an aspect of the defense is that statistics around sexual abuse say that you are most likely to be abused by a, you know, by a partner, by a family member, by a close family friend. So the data says that your abuse is going to come from the people most known to you. But the culture turns around and abandons children in a small insular group. And it does that by terrifying the child of strangers and the unknown, which renders them vulnerable. Because if you convince a child that everyone who's unusual is a threat, everyone they don't know is dangerous, but the most likely source of abuse is the people they know, you've, you've cross-wired the map. Because according to the data, what you might tell children is your family, your friends and your partners have all been raised in an abuse cult and they're dangerous because we've infected them with valuelessness. But if you go out and spend time with strangers and get to know new, new people, you'll be less isolated, less insular, more independent, and you'll be able to stand on the outside of your family system and look in and be able to candidly see, hmm, that looks pretty sick and unhealthy. That's an expression of valuelessness. And I'm not going to take it. But if you're dependent and maintained in an insular niche based on fear of the unknown, you can't, you, 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 you've kind of been psychologically imprisoned with the people most likely to abuse you. And so this, this is a, you know, so misinformation and ignorance based on secrecy is all part of the cult defense. And it's at all levels. 
Should I go out and talk to strangers? You talk to your church? No. Talk to your school? No. Talk to your parents? No. You talk to your government? No. So who's telling the truth? And so this is how the institutionalized defense system works. Isolate people. And this is typically the first thing that an abuser will do is try and isolate the victim from everyone else physically. Here, let's go into this place where nobody exists. So that's physical isolation. Or I'm threatened by your friends. Get rid of all those friends. They're not nice. They don't like me, whatever. Do all that away. In one way or another, um, because in order for an irrational event to occur, it can't be scrutinized because it breaks down. It's not intelligent to do in full view. So secrecy, partition, and isolation are key parts of this institutional narrative uh, of abuse. Now another, you know, of course, aspect is that when the message of valuelessness is not addressed as the core abuse and the core disease being transmitted, and instead the focus in a chauvinistic culture is in the outer form, then you can have a scenario where people say, oh, that's your husband uh, insulting you and doing this and that and the other, or that's your wife doing that to you. Eh, no big deal. That's, your, that's fine. You, they, you can hurt each other anyway. You're married. Um, but this stranger, oh my gosh, you know, they just looked at you badly. That's a bad person. And so you have this confusion between the behavior and the role. It doesn't matter if your spouse is saying, you know, there's some part of me that feels incredibly worthless and I want to feel one with you and I don't know how to get rid of this worthlessness, but I know how to make you feel worthless and it arouses me because there's a sense of flow and union. So what I want to do is I want to take a shit on your face. I want to, you know, spew my semen all over you, etc. And then I'll know we're married because we're both valueless. Because there's some part of me that knows that I'm shit. And now I know that you're shit too. And so we're one. We're one in valuelessness as opposed to saying, I'm a really valuable person and I've picked you as a really valuable person and we can be one in value in expressing in some way. And this doesn't work sexually if it's not real. If you believe you're shit and you treat your partner as if they're a princess or a king or something like that, you will feel completely separate because you're shit and they're a king and you won't feel connected unless they are like shit as well or unless you heal the disease of valuelessness and say you're a queen and I'm a king and we're one. We're both valuable. So this is a very uh, you know, deeply fundamental structural, cultural message. We give advertisers the legal authority to lie in a way that shames and humiliates people who do not own a particular product. And we give that out in our public airwaves. We allow the transmission of valuelessness and shame under the justification that money will be made by doing so, by selling products that people otherwise don't need, by deforesting the environment so the environment isn't valuable and people's being isn't valuable. The only thing that's valuable is the economy. And so if people can make a lot of money convincing you to destroy the environment, to buy things you don't need, so that you will feel valuable not because of who you are, but because of the things that you don't need that you bought that now supposedly, according to the advertisement, makes you valuable. It's part of the same inherent message that says the truth isn't valuable and who you are isn't valuable. And the advertisers aren't valuable, but 
the money that's being made by subjecting the body and the psyche to these lies, that money is valuable. And so it's worth disseminating all of these lies simply so that more money can be manufactured and concentrated into a few people when the data suggests that they don't have a scientific basis for doing so because they don't need it. So, you know, and coolness is, of course, part of that. And coolness, it's significant. If you look at the sociopathic empathic continuum, the sociopathic continuum is free of emotion. There's no emotion other than fear in a sociopath. They're cool. There's no warmth. There's no empathy. And there's a tremendous amount of heat high on the empathic continuum. But we don't aspire in a sociopathic cult to be empathic, to be warm. We aspire to be cool. The greatest thing in a sociopathic cult is to be more cool than the other person. And to be cool consists of not having intense feelings, often not caring about other people, having the newest, latest products that in some way put them onto a pedestal as defined by advertisers. That's what it is to be cool. Um, and it's a lie. Coolness is not intelligence in many objective measures of the efficiency of turning energy into human well-being. Empathy is a far more intelligent software system for generating well-being because when you have high levels of empathy and empathic intelligence, you can be on the beach with 20 people and out of nature and nothing, you can create high volumes of well-being. When you're high on the sociopathic continuum, you can't be happy unless you've got the latest Nike and then it's immediately dirt, dirty and you need a new one, etc. And it's, 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 a, it's a spiraling down, it takes more and more energy in a hedonic adaptation process that leaves you empty. Punishing both the, both the victim and the perpetrator for coming forward is also a very important part of the silent secrecy shame dynamic. The message is you should be ashamed to be a victim. If, you, if your father fucked you when you were five years old, don't tell anyone because it's not cool to be fucked when you're five years old. And so be ashamed, don't tell anyone because there's something unvaluable in you that is revealed. You're, you're, you are, are somehow less than someone who hasn't had that experience. That's not scientifically true. People who have been incestuously abused have had experience that, experiences that a large majority of people cannot understand, cannot empathize with, cannot do something with. And one of those is the higher likelihood of trans, uh, transcending the system. And if you look at what Eric Weinstein is doing in his various podcasts, etc., you see a tremendous amount of cultural transcendence and unique intelligence. And one of the reasons that that blossoms in you know, children who have been sexually abused is that they understand that the cult is not their friend. The cult is just keeping itself going by keeping itself going, by suppressing a lot of truth and uh, blowing up a lot of other information that keeps it going and maintains the status quo. Now, someone who is deeply betrayed by the status quo is not loyal to the status quo. So what do they become loyal to? It's usually intelligence. You can be loyal to the cult and maintaining the status quo, or you can be loyal to intelligence, which is the ef most efficient way of transforming energy into sustainable well-being. So you could say, objectively, 
that the victim of abuse has something valuable to contribute that those who have not been abused do not have. And you could say that the perpetrator has insight and value about the cult that other people don't understand. Because a lot of the time, particularly with successful chronic perpetrators, they understand a deeper truth, which is that nobody's watching anything. That w because if you're a victim or a perpetrator in a secret dynamic, one of the things you realize is that nobody's paying attention, that nobody sees you at all. They see the mask, and you realize, if I'm in this mask, and I'm pretending that I'm cool, and this and that and the other, and everyone's buying it, you realize that no one's actually seeing anyone. And that's an insight that is highly valuable to medicate, to help evolve an abuse cult. But shaming and punishing both the victim and the perpetrator, and usually the way that it works, because cults are committed to maintaining the status quo, not to transcendence and healing and intelligence. So usually how it works is the first wave of defense goes towards the victim. Don't come forward, don't rock the boat, don't talk about the pastor, don't say bad things about your dad, don't, don't, don't come forward. So if the victim violates the taboo of silence and secrecy and comes forward, usually they get a barrage of disbelief and defense and insanity and extra cruelty. But if they persist and make the link successfully with the perpetrator, now the perpetrator is revealed. Well, if a perpetrator is effectively and successfully revealed to the broader public, then the attack shifts from the victim. We couldn't keep you down. You didn't cooperate. Then it, it, it switches to the perpetrator. You're bad. Because remember, the cult is focused on the status quo. It's focused on avoiding sanity at all cost because sanity means change. So if we can't knock the victim down, now we've got to scapegoat the perpetrator. Why? Well, who raised the perpetrator? The cult. If we didn't raise perpetrators systematically and structurally, beginning with chauvinism, beginning with capitalism, beginning with a sustained materialistic barrage on the essence of the human being, we wouldn't have perpetrators and we wouldn't have victims. So the fact that we are raising large numbers of perpetrators who are only being contained by fear, because that's what governs a sociopath, and it's a very big difference to say that we have traumatized people into a reptilian state called fear, who feel completely helpless, powerless, and worthless. Now, helpless, powerless, and worthless people will attack and hurt other people the same way they feel about themselves. But then we're going to scare the shit out of our population with policing and jails and shaming and stuff, so that... The perpetrators, even though they don't care about themselves, and even though they don't care about other people, out of fear, will not enact all of their sociopathic cruelty that has been injected and in, 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 induced into them by their cult. And so we're raising reptilian brains in a traumatic and sociopathic cult that leads to low protection and low defense against the abuse and hostility coming towards us, then internalizing it, then becoming a perpetrator in select ways behind a veil of secrecy. Well, the cult doesn't have to acknowledge its fundamental flaws and go through a revolution if it can tell the lie 
that the cult is perfectly healthy and fine. No one needs to worry. There's going to be no change. Don't panic. No change is coming. All that we have here is one horrible, usually a man, horrible man here, who for some insane reason, despite being raised in a wonderful country with a healthy cult, is fundamentally bad. He's a bad apple in a beautiful tree that produces wonderful, wonderful healthy fruit. But he, this, it's, it's all about him. And so we, we hate that. So we're going to punish him. We're going we're gonna to send him to jail for 20 years. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to... And then we don't have to change because we're now spending $100,000 to put him in jail. And the cult says, aren't we wonderful? We caught the perpetrator. He's in jail. He's going to suffer for the rest of his life like he wasn't already. And now we can carry on with the status quo of buying and spending money, false advertising, chauvinistic education system, chauvinistic cultures, priests that have no sense of value. See, priests, as a general status quo, have a harder time than the average person because they're viewed as, viewed as close to God and they realize they're just as fucked up as anyone else in the cult but they can't talk about it because they're in a role that says they're close to God. So it's not too surprising that priests might be more pedophilic than the average person because they've got to wear more of a mask that lets them know that who they are isn't valuable because they've got to shut up about it and they've got to talk about God's love while they feel lonely. They've got to talk about, you know, peace of the Lord when they know their friends violating children. They know it's a lie. But we don't pierce the veil and let them be a human being and talk about it. We punish them if they step outside of our, their role. And so does the, the system of the church. If priests start telling the truth about how they actually feel and the way they experience and their doubts, they just get fired for someone, a better actor, who will pretend that the system is working. Because the system is not working, so it takes a fair amount of pretense to say the system is working. But the people at the top of the pyramids in a cult ranking system want other people to bolster the system, not to help the average human being. And a lot of the people who climb the cult hierarchy are some of the most unhealthy people because they, they got the message early on. You take a Trump, for example. You take a Trump, for example, who watches himself and his siblings being treated like shit, except for certain ranking dis distinctions. And he watches his father, who treats him like shit and who feels like shit be valued highly in rankings in power because of the money, because of getting things done, another masculine trait, not of being of, you, you got this done, so you're valuable. You didn't get this done, you're worthless. Your presence is worthless, you got it done, you're valuable. And in a ranking system, this trickles down. So if your boss is only valuable for getting things done, making someone money, then the only way that he gets to be valuable is if he's doing that. And the only way he gets to do that is if the employees make him a lot of money. So then the employees are worthless except if they make a lot of money. And then the customers are worthless unless they make the company money. And, and, and so everyone gets the message down the system, you don't matter what you produce does. And if you want to be more valuable to me, make me more money. You're not good enough to marry my daughter. Your money is good enough to marry my daughter and you don't have enough of it. 
get the fuck out of here. And when you have something valuable, not your being, not your caring, not your presence, then come back. And in an evolutionary sense, there's a certain amount of this that makes sense if you understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need to survive before you need to be secure in your survival, and you need to be secure in your survival before you need love and belonging. If you have love and belonging that vanishes in an hour because you both didn't survive, there's a certain amount of intelligence in saying, well, you've got to survive first. But as survival and security get uh, bloated and accentuated to being more important than love and belonging and more important than presence, then you may survive just fine with a 200 square foot house. You may be very, very secure. You don't have a mortgage. You built it yourself. But in the chauvinism of accentuated uh, materialism and capitalism, if you have a mansion with 50 rooms, you're considered to be more valuable than if you uh, are, uh, you know, have a, have a 200 square foot house. It, th that logic does not carry through particularly when you look at an ecological framework and say, well, is that really the planet we want, where everyone consumes so much unnecessary energy that the entire host body of our species collapses, pursuing the dogma of rabid materialism. Distracting, overcommitting, and avoidance is, of course, part of the cult ranking system of the exterior chauvinism that says, keep busy, keep busy, because if you do more, you're more important than if you do less. You keep him busy, and everyone knows the answer if they want to look good. You keep him busy, oh, I'm so busy, I can barely keep up. Oh, you must be important, says the cult. But everyone has had the same 24 hours since the history of time. And the fact that you're overcommitted doing unimportant things that have little to do with the well-being of yourself, your family, your species, and your planet does not make you important. It makes you a brainwashed cult member. Minimizing impact is something that comes out of chauvinism because if you say that, for example, oh, if someone broke your car and banged up your window. Oh, that's terrible. But someone shamed you? Someone snidely communicated constantly through endless cruelty that you have no value because they at the deep level feel like they have no value? Well, that's a, a virus. That's a virus that sinks in deep. It does a lot of damage, but it's not at the surface of your Rolls Royce. It's a damage of the soul. It's a damage of the psyche. But if any, everything inner matters less than everything that's outer as part of the cult dogma of chauvinism, well, then minimizing, come on, get on with it. You've, got, you've still got your Porsche. Go out and go for a ride. Go have a fling. Spend some money. You'll get over it. Don't worry about the inner world. The inner world doesn't matter because you don't matter and you identify, you know, more than we identify with our things, we identify with our thoughts and feelings. So when someone gives that message, you don't matter. It can do far more damage, but it is deflected, minimized, and denied. And then in order to make sure that attention doesn't get brought to this, an element of shame is, particularly for men, is brought in. Real men don't get affected by that. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. No, words can hurt the psyche tremendously. If lies and viruses of valuelessness are instilled through words, the way they're instilled through advertising, etc., all the time. Words do a tremendous amount of damage according to science, but the cult isn't listening to the science. The cult is listening to the chauvinistic dogma about being a real man 
which is a real man, is so dissociated from his feminine side that being abused, being shamed, eh, means nothing because his feminine side means nothing. And that's the part that takes the wound. Now, if a man's feminine side means nothing as, and is in fact shamed for advocating for his feminine side, well, why would the feminine side in a woman mean anything? If my feminine side makes me worthless, according to my dogmatic cult, then surely the feminine side in the female that I'm married to is worthless at the same level of worthlessness as the feminine side in myself is, is married, you know, is, is, uh, is valued. Because it doesn't make sense to say that the gold in here is worth two cents a pound, but the gold out there is worth $5,000 an ounce. It's the same gold. Feminine energy is feminine energy, be it in a man, be it in a woman, be it in a child, be it in a black person. That's the science. But we are not a scientific cult. Uh, deflection and encouraging positivity and moving on, saying that to be positive is better than to be negative. It's like saying the positive side of a battery is better than the negative side of the battery. You don't get electricity until you connect the two and channel them. You don't get change unless you have a vision for something positive and you are aware of something negative. And then you motivate movement between the two. You have movement, you have electricity. So to say be positive about the sexual abuse that occurred, be grateful for it, whatever it is, well, and not look at the negative side is a way to stall the movement and maintain the status quo.